Good morning, and welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Advent. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Agnus Day Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a copy of the worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. As we gather in worship this morning, we also celebrate the feast day of St. Lucy, or Santa Lucia. Lucy lived in the third century in Sicily. She was known for her care of the poor and her dedication to God in the form of a vow of virginity. Now, today virginity has become a decidedly patriarchal thing as it's been used as a standard by which we measure young women far more often than young men. But in Lucy's day, when a woman's contribution to her family and to society was almost ex exclusively based on her ability to marry and bear children, a vow of virginity was a powerful statement about sexual liberation and personal autonomy. According to one legend, in order to deter a particularly persistent suitor who admired Lucy's eyes, she allegedly gouged them out and gave them to him as a present. For this reason, she sometimes depicted in iconography as carrying her own eyes on a plate. In another story about Lucy, her mother, unaware of her vow of virginity, had her betrothed to a young man from a pagan family. She eventually persuaded her mother to give away her dowry to the poor instead of marrying her off to her fiance. But when he learned of this, he denounced her to the governor as a Christian and the governor demanded that she burn a sacrifice to the emperor. When Lucy refused, he ordered her to be defiled in a brothel, the ultimate insult to this chaste young woman. However, when the guards came to take her away, they couldn't budge her at all, not even when they hitched her to a team of oxen. Undeterred, they piled wood around her, but when they set it on fire, she wouldn't burn she finally was martyred with the sword. Now, because her name means light and because she was martyred around the time of the winter solstice, in spite of the fact that she was Italian, her feast day has become especially popular in countries where the winter days are so short and dark, especially like places like Scandinavia. On Santa Lucia's day, a young girl with a wreath of burning candles in her hair serves early morning sweets to her family and community. Today, we remember Lucy and her generosity, her unwavering devotion to God, and her refusal to let her parents or society or the government or even armed guards tell her what she could and couldn't do with her own body. Cheers, Lucy. Finally, before we begin our worship this morning, I'd like to share any prayer concerns that we might have with one another. If you have a prayer concern, I'll invite you to write it now in the comments or in the chat. And then I'll invite us to turn together to our bulletin as we begin our worship. We begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven, and you are free. Free from all that holds you back, free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened by God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I look around, I see shadows of sadness. Families in homeless shelters. People in prison. People who have become invisible and forgotten. When I look around, I see shadows of grief and loss. People dreading the holidays because they've lost a loved one. Because they've recently divorced. Because they don't want to spend another Christmas alone. In the face of sadness, we light a candle of joy. In the face of grief, in the face of loss, we light a candle of joy. May the light from this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's joy is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. Siblings in Christ, be not afraid. God's joy is at hand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, that anointed by your Spirit, we may testify to your light through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson today from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through him all things came into being, and without him not one thing that exists came into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens all people, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or the will of a man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of God. As the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor the prophet, nor Elijah? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who are you? When you meet somebody new, what do you, who do you say that you are? You probably start with your name, but that doesn't really tell the other person much about you except what you prefer to be called. So maybe you tell them what you do for a living, or what you did before you were retired. Maybe you tell them where you're from, or who your parents were, or what you like to do with your free time. But the truth is, none of that is you. Those are things about you, but they aren't you. In order to know who you are, a person has to spend some time with you. All those things are parts of what make up our identity, along with other things like our gender and our ethnicity and our political views and all those other little things that we use to make sense of ourselves. Each of those little factoids helps us categorize people. Man or woman, black or white, pilot or insurance salesperson or plumber. We take what we know about other people like that and we apply it to the people who wear that, these labels. Now usually this works and sometimes it helps us to know something about someone, someone else very quickly, but sometimes it doesn't. For example, when I meet people for the first time, especially people who I know I won't see again or get to know very well, I usually avoid telling them that I'm a pastor. 
pastor is one of those identities that comes with a lot of assumptions about who a person is. And sometimes I really don't want those strangers to apply those assumptions to me because they don't fit who I am. I want them to get a sense of who I am before they apply that pastor label to me. Another example. Stephanie's youngest sibling recently came out as gender non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Now their biological sex is female, but much like how I feel about people's assumptions about the word, about the identity of pastor, they aren't comfortable with the assumptions that come with an identity of either male or female. They have both masculine and feminine traits within who they are. They fall somewhere between what we think of when we think of as either a man or a woman. Now that's just a couple of examples of how fluid and artificial identity can be. The reality is that the identities that we have, they're constructed. We make them. In fact, we spend a great deal of time making and curating our identities, carefully deciding what we will show people so that, we will, so that they will make the assumptions that we want them to about us. For most of us, it's an invisible and automatic process. Only on rare occasion, like when somebody like my sibling-in-law rejects a traditional identity and upends both our expectations and our grammar, does that process become obvious and intentional. When John appears on the scene, baptizing and preaching, and the Pharisees in Jerusalem want to know who he is, they ask him, which identity he claims. They want to know on whose authority he's acting and how they ought to treat him. And so they try to figure out, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Who are you? What do you say about yourself? They're asking which of these identities, which of these sets of assumptions and expectations they can use to make sense of him. But John rejects all of these identities. He rejects all the assumptions that the Pharisees try to make about him. Who he is cannot be explained by words like Messiah or Elijah or prophet. But that's not all John is rejecting here. With his message and his ministry, he is rejecting the Pharisees' very understanding of God. He is saying that the identities that they are using to describe God, just like the labels they're trying to use to describe him, are incomplete that they can't use that identity to understand who God is. And since that's the only way they know God, he's saying they really don't know who God is. So can you understand why the Pharisees are upset? Their entire identity, their whole way of understanding and knowing themselves is built on their understanding of God. To be Jewish means to be one of God's chosen people. By suggesting that they are wrong about who God is, John is also saying that they are wrong about who they are, that everything they know about themselves is false. So we spend so much time cobbling together these little bits of identity, gender and social class and race and career and what have you, that when something calls these identities into question, we feel the need to defend them. It's kind of like a child on a beach trying to defend her sandcastle against the bigger kids who are running around kicking them all down. When John shows up, he's claiming to be sent from the same God who chose these Pharisees, but he's proclaiming a very different message. And so it's like he's trying to kick down their sandcastle. To the Pharisees, this is an act of aggression. It's an attack on them and their identity that they've spent so much time and energy curating. It's an attack on who they understand themselves to be. They see it as an attack on themselves. And that's why John gets arrested and executed. See, the Pharisees' problem and our problem is that we try to know God the same way we know ourselves and one another, through identities. But according to the evangelist, in Christ, God offers us an alternative to identity by which we might know God. And knowing God is important, the evangelist says, because knowing God 
helps us to know ourselves in a way that we never could otherwise. Jesus wants to make God known to us so that in his words, we may have life and have it abundantly. The truth to which John testifies is that identities, even our religious identities, are not who we are. Beneath these identities, these small separate selves, these sandcastles we create, at the very center of our being exists our true self, our truest self, our real self, what we sometimes call a person's soul or spirit. Thomas Merton, the 20th century monk and contemplative, writes about this center. He says, at the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or a spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes our lives, which is inaccessible to oh, the fantasies of our mind and the brutalities of our will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It is, so to speak, God's name written in us as our poverty, as our indigence, as our dependence, as our birthright. It's like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It's in everybody. And if we could see it, we would see these billion points of light coming together in the face and the blaze of a sun that would make all darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. That point of light that Merton sees at the center of our being, that is the light which is the life of all people. It's what St. Paul is talking about when he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. At the center of our being, beneath our identities that we create, is a being created by God, animated by God, at one with God. And that's why when the priests and the Levites question John about who he is, he doesn't do what you or I would do. He doesn't explain who his parents are or how he came to be doing this or recite a creed. Instead, he points directly to God. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. To understand this is to understand who we really are apart from who we think we are. Our mistake is that we, we misunderstand, we, we mistake our constructed selves for our truest selves. We get so caught up in the sandcastles that we've made that we think that they are us. And we defend them, even to the death, never realizing that they're just walls and a ceiling and a floor around the pure glory of God alive within us. The light of creation shining and blazing out through us. We fail to recognize that we are united in God with everyone else. That these separate constructed identities are just an illusion that we've created. John points to this fundamental tragedy that because we don't even know who we are, we don't know the one who stands among us. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. As long as we remain ignorant to this truth, we will spend our entire existence fighting over the bits and the bobs that we stick together with spit and mud to create these separate selves, these identities, these illusions of who we are. And so, to show us who we are, Christ comes to show us God. The light of creation comes among us so that we might recognize in him the same light shining within us, within all humankind. 
and see that because it is Christ who lives in us, we are indeed all branches of the same vine, all castles constructed of the same sand. To see that Jesus meant it literally when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, not like yourself, but actually as an extension of yourself, as part of you. This kind of love is not only God's will for us, it's the very point and fulfillment of our being. Living in this reality allows us to know, to enjoy, to draw upon the light that is the life of all people. To experience that true life that Jesus describes as abundant and eternal. Knowing this God made flesh, this Christ who dwells within us, allows us to finally do what we never could on our own. To repent, to turn away from those incomplete, uh, separate selves, those identities that we use to describe ourselves, that we construct, and to turn instead toward an existence in union with the light of all creation. A life of union with God and with one another. Such a turning away from these things that we think of as ourselves might feel like a dying. To feel what you think is your very self slipping away. But during Advent, we remember that these things are not ourselves. That our true self, our real self, exists deeper. When we remember what it is that we're turning toward, suddenly, even losing our very understanding of who we think we are feels like losing nothing important at all. Growth can flower from our grieving. That 
with the whole people of God in Jesus Christ. Let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. For the whole church, its ministry, and the mission of the gospel. For peace and justice in the world, the nations and those in authority, and our local community. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, lonely. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. For August Day and for the for the people closest to us. For the faithful departed. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Advent is a season of waiting and preparing for God. Right now, I'd like to invite you to prepare your own gifts of bread and wine or juice to share in the Eucharist from your home. In this meal, God takes the humble gifts that we bring and uses them to nourish us body, and soul. In the same way, God takes all the humble gifts that we donate to this ministry and uses them to bless us, so that we might in turn be a blessing to the world. If you'd like to join me in supporting this ministry of God's blessing, you can find a link in the video description below to our webpage, where you can give a one-time gift or set up a recurring donation to help make sure that the ministry of Anya Stay Lutheran Church continues. Thank you for your generosity and for your presence here today. Mysterious God, in the beginning the darkness waited, and you created light. Sarah and Abraham waited for a future, and you sent descendants greater than the stars. The Hebrew slaves waited for rescue, and you sent Miriam and Moses to enact your liberation. Israel waited in exile for renewal, and you empowered prophets and poets with your life-giving speech. 
as the whole world groaned in waiting for release and rebirth, you sent Jesus, born of strong Mary, fathered by humble Joseph, incarnate in our humility, in solidarity with the suffering and the poor, full of wisdom and grace for all. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Hoping beyond hope, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering all your promises fulfilled in Jesus' body given for the beloved universe, in the great hope of the resurrection, and in all that is to come by your mercy, with eager expectation we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Send your spirit into this broken world, into our hopeful, imperfect gathering, and on this sacred bread and wine, so that we may be healed and whole again, and filled with the courage to love. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and thanks to you, Holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit, here and now and into the great beyond. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal today, receive this blessing. May the word made flesh fill you, heart, mind, and soul with the light and the love of God. Amen. If you are receiving the meal today, then I invite you to hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. 
Gracious and abundant God, you have done great things for us, and we rejoice. In this bread and cup, you give us life forever. In your boundless mercy, strengthen us and open our hearts to the needs of the world. For the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude today, I'd like to just once again thank you for all the wonderful um, pictures and photos of your Advent wreaths that you sent in. It's truly a delight in this time when we're not able to gather together in the same building to be reminded uh, just uh, how many and how wonderful are the saints that gather with us in worship. Thank you for enriching the worship service this way. If you haven't shared yet, uh, there's still a chance to do so. Please just send your videos to uh, videos or photos to Cindy in the office or share them on our Facebook page and we'll make sure that they make it into the slideshow. We do still have Advent wreath and Jesse tree packets available outside the front of the church, as well as hymnals available for checkout. Um, next week, I think the forum is doing a Christmas carol sing, uh, for which it would be very handy to have a hymnal. So um, please just call the office and let us know when you can come by and pick one up and we'll be happy to sign one out to you. If you'd like one, but are not comfortable leaving your house or are unable for some reason, uh, not a problem, just let us know and we can arrange to have a friend drop it off. Finally, just a reminder that if you're plan planning to give through ELCA Good Gifts this, uh, this year at Christmas in honor or in memory of a loved one, you can do that directly through their website, elca.org slash goodgifts. That's uh, good gifts, one word. Then let Cindy know the name of the person that you're honoring and the amount that you donated by December 18th so that they can be listed in our Christmas worship bulletin. Thank you once again for being a part of this service today. It's so wonderful to be able to gather here with you, even in this uh, digital format. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can gather right here with Anya's Day for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m and every weekday evening at 7 p.m. we will gather on Zoom for a short Advent devotional using Father Richard Rohr's book, Preparing for Christmas. The link to that Zoom meeting, as well as links to various other uh, meetings and activities happening in our congregation can be found under the Events tab on our website, onyestaylutheran.org. Go in peace, Christ is with you. Amen. I invite you to share a sign of that peace with someone you know with a phone call or a text or an email. You can also share the piece by sharing this video on your Facebook page or by sending the link to a friend so that you can worship together. Thank you again for being here. God bless you in your week.